Science and religion is a big topic and uh, could be discussed fruitfully for six months. Um, I want to take two issues that are probably the central issues in the debate. I want to make one point about each issue. I hope it'll be simple enough and clear enough to be useful. I'm not presuming any scientific background or scientific understanding. Um, but I want to start with a piece of logic which is crucial for tonight and crucial in general to understand. Uh, a piece of logic that uh, helps to define when you're having a discussion what's the point of the discussion, what the outcome could be. And that concept is burden of proof. And I want to illustrate it first by American legal system and then show you how it applies to general discussions and give a piece of advice as to how to conduct them. And then we'll dive into the two scientific issues, which are the age of the universe and the theory of evolution. Let's say you have a criminal trial in the United States. So somebody is accused of a crime. The prosecutor is arguing for guilt and the defense attorney is arguing for innocence. What is the responsibility of the prosecutor? What must he do to win the case? He has to show that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. He has to show that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. What must the defense attorney do to win the case? Does the defense attorney have to show that he's innocent? Or show that he's innocent beyond a reasonable doubt? Not at all. Not at all. All the defense attorney is supposed to do is to show that there's a reasonable doubt of guilt. If he shows there's a reasonable doubt of guilt, then the prosecutor loses. The prosecutor has to show that he's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And the defense attorney says, you're wrong, there is a reasonable doubt. If the prosecutor wins, we have very good reason to think he's guilty. If the defense attorney wins, we have very good reason to think nothing. He might very well be guilty. He might be innocent. We don't know either one. All we know is he wasn't convicted according to the law. That's all we know. I'm not sure about this because I didn't look it up, but you know that a, a, a trial by jury, the jury has asked for its verdict. There are two verdicts. One verdict is guilty. and What's the other verdict? Not guilty. There's no verdict of innocent. The jury never says innocent. It's either guilty or not guilty. Guilty means we have enough evidence to have uh, declared him guilty by the law, and not guilty means you don't have enough evidence to have declare him guilty, guilty by the law. He might still be guilty. Now, this is the way it goes in a, in a criminal court of law in the United States. Um, any, in any discussion where people are discussing an issue and where they have differing opinions and they're trying to settle it, in theory, there are three different ways it could go. Suppose the two people discussing are A and B. You could say to A, look, you have your opinion. I would like to know why you, ha you take your opinion. I would like to know what reason you give. Show me a reason that will convince me that your opinion is correct. So A has the burden of proof to show that he's right. What is B doing? B might simply say to A, listen, my opinion is not on the table now. I'm not interested in discussing my opinion. Or he might say, I don't have an opinion. I've made up my mind. But you say that you know. You know what's right. You tell me why you think it's right. And I'm going to test your reasons to see whether your reasons are good enough to convince that you're right. Here you have exactly the prosecutor and the defense. A is the prosecutor. He's saying, I know I'm right. And he's being challenged to give reasons to support that he's right. B is simply checking whether the reasons A gives are good enough reasons or not good enough reasons. If A wins the struggle, then we should walk away saying that A is right. If B wins the struggle, 
Usually we walk away saying we don't know anything. Because all Bish accomplished was to cast doubt on A's reasons. For all we know, A is right, just doesn't give the right reasons. Now, if the discussion is going to be complete, so they should change sides. Second half is, if B succeeds in casting doubt on A's reasons, so then we can ask B, you, do you have an opinion? You think that you're right? Let's hear your reasons. Let's see how far it goes. And here, two, you have one or two outcomes. B may present really good reasons, in which case we'll say, oh, we learned something. B is right. Or B may fail. His reasons may be shown to be inadequate, in which case we now sum up the whole discussion. A doesn't have good reasons, and B doesn't have good reasons. And therefore, we don't know what's right. We should be agnostic. That is a very reasonable procedure. I think it's a, it's, it's a favorite procedure. Because in each stage of the discussion, you know exactly what's going on. In the first stage, A is giving reasons, and B is attacking those reasons. And the conclusion is either A wins or he doesn't win. The second stage, the same is true for B. What I think is poor choice, poor method, which creates unclarity and cross-purpose and cross -purpose talking, is where A and B are both trying to prove their respective points at the same time. And uh, I think that creates confusion. And if you can get the other person you're speaking with to agree uh, to do it one side at a time, I think it will create tremendous, uh, tremendous clarity. Because very often, very often, whether we're discussing the existence of God or we're discussing the existence of absolute morality or we're discussing evolution or other things, if one side is trying to prove its point and it's not going well, and the reasons are being knocked down, at a certain point, that side says, well, you prove that you're right. That's a foul. That's a foul. That wasn't the question. What he's implying is, if you can't prove you're right, then I win. But that's wrong. If he can't prove that he's right, that just means I don't have to give in. But it doesn't mean that I win. Because I may not have proved that I'm right either. In which case, no one wins. That's called shifting the burden of proof. It's as if to say, if you can't substantiate your point of view, I win by default. But that's ridiculous. Once I put it on the table like that, it's obviously ridiculous. Whatever position you take, you owe reason for taking it. Nothing, you don't get anything free without reason. So I, I, I think that in every discussion, this should be clarified at the beginning. Now, I'm going to be talking about the age of the universe and evolution. Um, we are in a situation where there's a massive uh, group who believe they know the truth. They know it for sure. It's nailed down. It's all settled. There's no debate about it. And anybody who disagrees is either woefully ignorant or unsophisticated or uneducated or prejudiced or a liar or something else. There's just, just nothing to talk about. So what I'm trying to do is ask them Give me your reasons for thinking you're right. And let's see whether you can substantiate what you're saying. And I'm going to check whether your reasons are good enough. My position is not going to come up. I, all I want is parity. I want equality. I don't think you can substantiate your position. I don't think you can nail it. I don't think that you can uh, make, uh, make it necessarily correct. In which case, if you're honest, what you'll say is, well, I took this position for these and these reasons, but I understand that there are counter-reasons, and I can't understand that I can't uh, prove that my reasons are better, and I prefer these reasons, which is fine. That's perfectly all right. A person can do that. Nothing wrong with that. So uh, I, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm going to avoid, and I hope that those who are listening will be able to avoid, is thinking, well, let's say, if you're not accepting 13.8 billion years of the age of the universe, prove to me it's shorter. Prove to me that it's 5,600 years. And if you can't, then 13.8 billion win, wins. That's incorrect. 13.8 billion has to stand on its own. It has to give its own reasons. And either its reasons are good enough or they aren't good enough. If there were no alternative or if the alternative were 20 billion or the alternative were five minutes, you have to substantiate your position not by simply 
avoiding other positions, what you have to do is show that your position is correct. And I think that the Asian universe people can't show their position is correct. And I think that evolution can't show that it's correct. So in that case, well, if I'm successful this evening, what a person should walk away uh, saying is, surprise, surprise, we don't know the answer. And that'll be fine with me. That's what I'm trying to accomplish. Okay, so it's clear where I'm coming from? Okay, let's start with the age of the universe. Um, we're struggling with 13.8 billion versus 5,000, etc. Rambam struggled with a much more difficult problem. In his days, almost everyone, outside of religious believers, almost everyone believed that the universe has no beginning at all. It was 4,000 against infinity. Aristotle was the big gun in favor of infinity, and many, many others agreed with him. And the Rambam has a finite age, of course, from Bracious. Now, the Rambam explains his position, why he doesn't, why he's not required to buy the infinity for the age of the universe with a parable. This is in part 2, chapter 17 of the Guide of the Perplexed. In this parable, a baby boy is born, and after some months after birth, his mother dies. And his father takes him to a colony of only men. And the boy grows up, <clears throat> and at a certain age, he asks the elders, where did we come from? How did we get here? <clears throat> and the answer he gets is this. Well, the truth is there are others who are like us in many respects, but different in some, in some other respects. And each one of us starts out as a tiny miniature inside the abdomen of one of those. And you start out inside the abdomen, and then you, you're there for a number of months, and then you come out, and then you grow, and you grow up to be the way you see us now. So the child says, tell me something. When we are these miniatures inside the abdomen of those others, can we breathe? Can we drink? Can we eat? And of course, the answer to all those questions is no. So the child says, then I know you're wrong. What you're telling me can't be true. Everyone knows that if you don't breathe for eight minutes, you're dead. Everyone knows that if you don't drink for a month, you're dead. Everyone knows if you don't eat for three months, you're dead. The story you're telling me is impossible. I know, because I know what people need to live, and I know what makes people die. Now, in a certain sense, he's right. Given everything he has seen, everything he knows from experience, from the life that he has observed, nothing can live. It doesn't breathe at eight minutes. It doesn't drink for a month. It doesn't eat for three months. It's impossible. What's the truth? The truth is there's another form of life totally different from anything he's ever seen. And what he has seen doesn't prepare him for and doesn't enable him to understand that there's another form of life which operates in a very different way. So what we say to the child is, given what you know, given what you've seen and experienced, you're absolutely correct. You're taking what you've seen and experienced and you're extrapolating that information to this story and you're saying, sorry, according to what I've seen and experienced, that story is impossible. It's just that what you have seen exist and, and experienced is only a subset of reality. It's another part of reality that you haven't seen. Ramam says that what we call the six days of creation are the gestation of the universe. It's like the pregnancy of the universe before it's born. What we observe as the universe is how it operates after it's born, just like this child sees people only after birth. Doesn't see pregnant women, doesn't see children born, he just sees them after birth. He takes everything about life after birth, and then he says, well, this is what life is. So the story of being inside the abdomen, etc., is an impossible story. Rabban says you're doing exactly the same thing. You're taking what you call the laws of nature, which are how the universe runs after the gestation is over, after the six days are finished, that's how it runs. That's all you've seen. You've only seen how it runs afterwards. You take that as the whole picture and you push it backwards and you say, well, 
if this is the way that it runs, and this is how old it must be, this is how it must have been developed, and so forth and so on. Because you're taking what you see as if it's the whole story. But it isn't. It isn't the whole story. What you see is a description of what happens after six days have already been concluded. And those six days are different. What's operating in the universe is very different. I don't want to say totally different, but very different from what we see today. And that being the case, no conclusions can be drawn about what went on in what you call the prehistory of the universe, the gestation of the universe, before it arrived at this state where the, the laws are functioning, where the law, the functioning now. Which means that in order to draw the conclusion about the age of the universe, there's a hidden assumption under the table without which you can't move. And that is, what I see is what has always been. What I see has, is what has always been. Once you make that assumption, the laws you see operating now are the laws of the universe all the way back, then you can make these extrapolations. The minute you change that, then you can't make the extrapolation anymore. Once you see that, so you say, okay, so they've arrived at their conclusion by making an assumption. It's a free world. You can make assumptions if you like. There's nothing wrong with making assumptions. Just advertise it, thank you. Don't put it under the table where nobody can see it. Advertise it. This is the conclusion that we draw, having made this and this assumption. Someone who did this, honestly, was Stephen Weinberg. So there are people out there who are applauding for the atheists. Well, here's one you should applaud for. Stephen Weinberg was a famous card-carrying atheist. And he wrote a book called The First Three Minutes, which came out a long time ago. I read it when it came out. It was really a fascinating book. What they knew then about the first three minutes of the Big Bang. And in the introduction, he says, I want you to know that everything that we believe about the universe as a whole is based on two assumptions, homogeneity and isotropy, what's called the cosmological principle, which means roughly, in simple layman's terms, whatever you see, wherever you look, if you were anywhere else in the universe and looked in any other direction, you'd see roughly the same thing. The universe is the same from every point of view, at every point in space. He said, if we don't make that assumption, we can't draw any conclusions whatsoever about the universe. None. Age of the universe and its development and everything else, all off the boards. And he puts it in the introduction. We have to make this assumption. Stephen Hawking says exactly the same thing. He put it in the Brief History, uh, brief history of Time. He told you the cosmological principle that everything looks the same from everywhere in the universe in every direction. And he said, you, you won't believe me, but you can look it up. He said, we believe the cosmological principle on the, on the, on the grounds of humility. Stephen, did I hear that right? Humility? Humility is what makes science run? Without humility, you can't get to your conclusions? That's right, because the reason I think that the universe looks the same everywhere else as it does from here is because I don't think we're special. I don't think we're different. I don't think we're unique. I think we're just trivial byproducts of the, universe, of, the, of the universe's operations, and we're no different from anything else. But if, if things look differently from here than they look with somebody else, then we'd be different. We'd be, we might be special. No, I'm not, I'm not accepting that. So the ground of the, of the humility that not, nothing's special, everything's ordinary, everything's typical, then I can take my observations and say, from everywhere else you see the same thing, and because you see everything, everything else the same thing, you can draw general conclusions about the universe. This is how this kind of science called cosmology is done. You make certain assumptions, you draw certain conclusions. But the assumptions themselves are free. And if you have to back yours up with humility, that means you don't have any good scientific reasons for it. Excuse me. So, this is the challenge to the, to the person who says, we know 13.8 billion years. Got it nailed down, sewn up. It's finished. There's no discussion and no debate. Excuse me. You have it nailed down on the basis of this assumption. It's a free assumption. We don't happen to share that assumption. I think that neutralizes the playing field. I think at this point, all he can say is, well, these are the assumptions we make when we do science. That's good. That's fine. You have, you have your activity and you've set up its rules and you draw your conclusion, probably your papers. Just remind yourself and admit to everybody else that you're making a free assumption that other people don't have to accept. Are we together? Okay, I think that neutralizes uh, the age of the universe. Now, when it comes to evolution, I want you to know, I studied evolution for a long time. Evolution is like a sugi in the Gemara. 
You have basic concepts, you have rules, you have observations, you have deductions, you have contradictions and resolutions, so on and so on. The concepts are open for definition, and definitions are often debated and not accepted. And in evolution, maybe the most important concept is species. There are at least eight different definitions of species. And in each context, you decide which one you're going to use because, you know, because the other ones don't work. And they're debated. Not everybody agrees to all the definitions of species. It's, it's, it's fascinating, complex, subtle. You can have a series of experiments, and one person will say this series of experiments supports this view, and another one will say the very same series of experiments supports a competing, a competing view. It's a pretty complex, difficult, challenging study. But I'm not going to go into that complexity. I'm going to make a simple point of logical method. Um, and I challenge you, uh, take these points, write to your philosophers, your professors of philosophy, professors of science, professors of methodology, uh, write to your experts. I've challenged uh, students the, here for 40 years to do that. Get me answers. Find me somebody who says differently. I'll be interested to see it. This happens to be close to my field. My field is philosophy and mathematics. So I know the literature. I know you're not going to find it. So here's, here's, the, here's the idea. I'm going to give you a parable, and then I'll show you how it applies to evolution. I tell the following story. I have an object. On one side of the object, I painted an X. Now, I tell you, I threw the object into the air three times. Three times in a row, it landed on the X, and that was purely by accident. The object isn't weighted on one side, it's not magnetized, it's not, they have got ridges that catch the air currents that make sure it falls on one side. I don't throw it in any specific way to make it fall on one side. Three times in a row, it landed on the X by accident. That's what I tell you. How would you react to a, a statement like that? Could you believe it? Should you believe it? Should you be in doubt? Should you reject it? How would you react to a statement like that? Most people tell me, seems reasonable, and I, I could certainly accept it. And I point out to them that uh, I think you're saying that because you're assuming that the object is a coin. Hmm. If the coin has two sides, then the probability of its falling three times in a row on, one, on the same side is one-eighth, which is 12.5%. That's not so unreasonable. 12.5% is not so unreasonable. But you see, I didn't tell you what kind of object it was. I didn't tell you how many sides it has. Let's suppose it's a shilly gun with a thousand sides. Well, what's the probability of getting the same side three times in a row? If you designate it from beforehand, well, it's a thousand times a thousand times a thousand. Now, if you're a red-blooded American, that's a billion. And if you're a poor Brit, it's a thousand million because their billions have 12 zeros, right? It's a lot. So it's the shilly gun, you're for sure not going to accept it. You're going to say that if it landed on the same side of a thousand sides three times in a row, something's weighted there, something's magnetized, something special is going on there. That doesn't happen by chance. Not that it couldn't, but the probability is so low that it's very suspicious that something else is going on. <coughs> Fine. So if it's a coin, you could accept it. If it's a shilly gun, you're certainly going to re reject it. Suppose I don't tell you. But what object was it, Dr. Cutley? Not telling you. My secret. Not telling you. If I don't tell you what kind of object it is, what should your response be to my assertion that it fell three times on the same side by accident? Your response should be, you haven't given us enough information to make up our minds. When somebody claims that something happened by accident, the way you make up your mind to believe it or not is asking how probable the accident was. If it's very, very improbable, you're going to be very suspicious. If it's reasonably probable, which could be 1 in 10 or 1 in 20 even, then maybe you'll accept it. If they say to you, it happened by accident, but refuse to tell you what the probability is, at that point you say, well, if you don't tell me what the probability is, you haven't given me enough information to rationally make up my mind. You might be right, but you certainly haven't, not only haven't you given me, you, ha you haven't made it possible to make up my mind because I'm going to make up my mind on the basis of the probability. Okay, 
I hope this is pavel. You know, I hope that an intelligent eight-year-old could understand this. So then, when you come to evolution, which roughly says, and I gave the introduction, it's only roughly, and this one says tweak it this way, and tweak it that way, and some people say do it only on Thursdays and only in January. It's all controversial. But this is the basic idea, that there are two principles that drive evolution. One is that um, traits are heritable. Three principles. Traits are heritable. You get to trace some of your traits from your parents based on the genetic material that they pass down to you. And the genetic material changes in an accidental manner. The way it changes is not guided, directed, managed, uh, programmed by anyone or anything. And the changes in the genetic material, which give you changes in your traits, change your ability to survive and your ability to reproduce. Those three principles, heredity, changes in hereditary material, uh, which is unguided, and um, the impact of the hereditary material on the traits which enable you to reproduce, that's what drives evolution. So, let me just sketch it for you. Let's imagine the first thing that can make copies of itself is self-replicator. Call it A. Somehow A comes into being, put it in the soup of the oceans, and then, because A makes copies of itself, after a while there are two A's. Oh, two. But then, since A's make copies of themselves, after a while there are four A's. And after... There are four A's or eight A's. And then there are 16 A's and 32 A's. The A's are multiplying. More and more A's. And each A turns into two A's because it shares the genetic material. So being an A is heritable from the genetic material. But the genetic material changes from time to time. It doesn't always, the replication isn't exact. Whether you call my, um, um, cosmic rays causing mutations or genes duplicating themselves or various changes take place. Not often, but they do take place. And nothing's guiding them. Nothing's controlling them. So if that's the case, then you expect after a while that there'll be changes. The A's won't look like A's anymore. These new A's with the changes in them will look different. Now, almost always a change, a random accidental change in the genetic material, results in death. You know, it would be sort of like taking a line of code out of your computer software and replacing it with a line from the telephone book. I don't think that will improve the functioning of your computer. Most likely, you know, it will just crash from time to time, become much slower. The vast majority of times when you poke around on the genetic material randomly, you're going to, you're going to make it worse and destructive. But let's say you have a trillion tries or a quadrillion tries. With so many different tries available, sometimes, just by accident, you'll make an improvement in the ability to survive. <clears throat> so if the A's are reproducing, 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 almost all the time you get more A's. Sometimes you get changes which are drastic failures. And one in a trillion times, you get a change that's an improvement. Okay. Let's call that A star. Now, the A's are making more A's, and A star is making more A stars. And it's better at making copies of itself. Let's say it's faster. Let's say these copies are more durable, because all the copies fall apart sooner or later. Maybe you can make copies under a wider range of, of uh, temperatures, or a wider range of uh, available sunlight, or whatever. So the A stars are made faster, more durable, and then pretty soon there's a competition. A stars and A's, they're competing for the raw materials to make more copies, and the A stars are better at it. So it's going to tilt in favor of the A stars until, until you get a double star, because the A stars reproductive process isn't perfect, and then mistakes are made and alterations are made by accident, and until you get a double star. And that's it. That's the story of evolution. Just things making copies. And the, you know, the, the uh, characteristics of the organism are inherited with the genetic material and it changes the material. And then sometimes that improves the ability to, to re reproduce. That's the whole story from amoebae 
to redwood trees, to butterflies, to orangutans, to you name it, sea, uh, sea sponges and whatever it is. That's the whole story. So now, here's the, cru the crucial question. Um, I understand the survival business. You've got things in the environment. There's raw materials. Each one's trying to make copies of itself. They're different from one another. They make copies in different ways. So one might be better and one might be worse. So I can understand that. I can understand this competition. Then one will do better and one will do worse. There will be new ones coming in because of the change in the genetic material. But let's say you've got a butterfly. Or let's say you have an octopus. How did you get the octopus so that it can compete? Where did it come from? It's what some people who have a taste for silly language call not the survival of the fittest, but the arrival of the fittest. Where did it arrive from to compete, to be on the stage of competition? Well, it came from all those unguided, unmanaged, unfocused changes in the genetic material, which we called accidental. And by the way, I, uh, I don't know if you are aware of this, but if somebody's watching the recording. When I say random, I'm quite aware there's no definition of random. Or there are several suggestions and none of them are really adequate. So that's why I say, that's why I say random and accidental and unguided and unfocused and unmanaged. It means the opposite of control. Control for the sake of a goal. Well, how to call it positively is a big, big problem. I'm not, I'm not committing myself on that. So the question will be then, okay, you started with a single cell somewhere and you ended up with an octopus. How many of these changes in the genetic material does it take to get from a single cell to an octopus? They're taking place unguided, unmanaged, unfocused. So then I want to know what's the probability of that happening according to the way these things operate without guidance, without focus. This is just like throwing the object into the air and getting it to land on the X three times in a row by accident. So you're telling me that we got from the first cell to the octopus by accident. Well, I want to know what the probability of that is. Now, between you and me, nobody knows. Not only does nobody know, but it's very probable that no one can know. You don't believe me? Write to your professors, get the literature, ask them, where does it say what the probability is of getting from the first self-replicator to an octopus and a redwood tree and a butterfly and... You won't get an answer. There is no answer. I can give you a reason why there can't be an answer. I mean, we can talk about that if we have time. But at any rate, there is no answer. Well, I say then, you want me to believe that something happened by an unguided, unmanaged, accidental process, and you can't give me the probability that it would happen, then you have no right to ask me to believe it. I could only make up my mind to believe it if it was probable enough. You say, but there are billions of years. Lots and lots and lots of things can happen in billions of years. I hear that. I think that's right. Lots and lots. How many is lots and lots? Then how many changes do you need? And which lots and lots is bigger? but you can't tell me. You can't give me numbers on it. So if that's the case, you have no right to ask me to believe it. Your theory doesn't have enough information in it to make up my mind whether it's true or false. That seems to me to be a simple argument. I think any intelligent 12-year-old could understand it. And I've been making it for decades, and I'm not, not only I make it, but it's in the literature, one who put this forcefully and got all... Dick broke loose over his head was Thomas Nagel in his wonderful book, uh, Mind and Cosmos, subtitle of which is Why the Neo-Darwinian Materialistic Philosophy of the World is Almost Certainly False. Almost Certainly False. And he credits um, um, intelligent design people as, as they should be credited. Um, but he, of course, is an atheist. <clears throat> and although he says in that book, I understand why someone would appeal to God in order to solve some of these mysteries, I understand, in other words, the logic of the appeal, the, the reasonableness of the appeal, but I'm not religious, I don't want to do it that way. I'm going in a different direction. He doesn't condemn them, doesn't say they're out of court, doesn't say they're silly and stupid and medieval and su superstitious. No, he just says they have a way to, to work with it. I want to work in a different way. That's what his book is about. At any rate, um, 
it seems to me then that th there's no reasonable way in which they can tell you that you must believe this because it's known to be true. It isn't known to be true. Now, having said that, I want to add one more thing and then we can discuss the whole thing and whatever comes to your mind. This, I think, is simple, logical, and incontrovertible. There's a fellow at uh, Yale University. He's a professor of computer science. So I guess he's not dumb, hey? Professor of computer science at Yale? Hmm. And his name is David Gelernter. Yes, he's Jewish. Yes, he's Shomer Mitzvos. He's a religious Jew. And he wrote an article where, on the basis of a very particular problem of development, as articulated by certain scientists, he says he thinks that in this particular area, this very small, well-defined area, the probability is just so overwhelmingly small that that's enough to reject. No, it's a very important reason to reject, to, to conclude that the Darwinian picture is false. Not there isn't enough information to make up your mind, but it's really false. This is protein folding. You have a long string of, of uh, uh, atoms which make up a protein. A protein as a long string is useless. Put it on your banjo and strum it. All the, all the proteins fold. After all, the DNA is something like six feet long. How do you get it inside a cell, huh? Get it inside because it folds. Scrunches itself up. Proteins also fold themselves up. And their functionality depends upon how they fold. If, we don't know, some, some strings of protein can fold in several ways. Some actually change their folds dynamically. But out of the logical possibility of 10 to the 40 different possible ways to fold, it only folds in two or three ways. Now, you imagine a soup of, of atoms and molecules floating around, banging into each other and linking up and so forth and so on. And you try to calculate the probability of getting a set of them that will fold in a functional way. So you have to ask how many of the ways of linking them together will fold at all, and how many of them, when they fold, will fold into functional ways, and how many of the folds will be non-functional. And it turns out, like, the ratio of functional to non-functional is like 1 to 10 to the 30. 10 to the 30 is infinity. And it's like the a, a trillion lifetimes of the universe, a trillion lifetimes of a trillion universes, it's beyond reach in probability. So he says, you got to get functioning proteins. We all built on pro functioning proteins. If it's really happening the way Darwin says it's happening, then the probability is less than 1 to 10 to the 30. And that being the case, it's ruled out because the probability is much too small. With 4.2 billion years of development of life, with 40 billion, with 140 billion, with a trillion years of development, you're not going to get it. So he says that he has a positive argument based on the probability which rules it out. Now, if you want to see this, this was published in the Claremont Review of Books. And to David Gelernter, Evolution, it will come up right away. Um, and as I said, if you have somebody who's a skeptic and he's very scientific and he believes in, you know, in, in Darwin and all the rest, ask him if he's read this article. And ask him if he knows of any scientific critique of the article, other than just name-calling. You know, and, uh, and, and he's religious. That makes it awful, right? Uh, how could you trust somebody who's religious? Uh, but the details are there. They're in the, in the literature, the details. Not saying, believe me, here they are. Show me where it's wrong. But other, other than that, so that's, that's, I think, like icing on the cake. If you can actually have a positive argument that it's wrong, then I'm bearing the burden of proof. But I think the question of the probability is just, is just you know, something that's, uh, that's, that's uh, means, that, means that it can't be, can't be articulated, and the demand can't be made that you should accept it. Now, I'll, I'll mention one reply which people make, even though it's colossally stupid. Um, and the reply is, but look, it really happened, didn't it? It really did happen. Life is here. So if it happened, it must be probable. I hear you when you say that doesn't look probable, and I hear you that it's difficult to figure out what the probability is, but post facto, when you know it's here, then you know that it must have been probable. The very fact that it exists shows that it was probable. I don't know where to begin. I mean, we are discussing or debating how it got here. Not whether it got here, but how it got here. Yes, it's here. 
if by process A, the probability of it's getting here is extremely low, you don't say, oh, but it's here, so then we must be wrong about the, pro pro the probability of process A. What you say is, there must be a process B. You're not wrong about A, unless you can show me something wrong with the argument. You don't figure out that we must be wrong because it's here. What you figure out is that appealing to A must be wrong. And there must be some other process that's, 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 useful, that's producing it. This is the way you would operate in any other, in any other situation. Uh, my computer works fine, and it, do, it does everything I want to do, except when I write letters to George. Those letters never get there. It seems to me that's sabotage. It seems to me somebody says, no, this computer is malfunctioning. I said, but the probability of it's malfunctioning in just letters to George is very low. Said, no, it isn't, because it happened. So probability has to be right that it's malfunctioning. And the probability is higher than you thought. And it really is malfunction. So, sorry, you know, go back to third grade. The other possibility is sabotage. <laughs> I don't say that it's really more probable by accident than I thought. What I say is it's very low probability by accident, so therefore it's sabotage. So don't tell me it really must be probable, and this is written in the literature, that it must be probable because it happened. On the contrary, the fact that it happened and it's improbable by Darwin, Darwin principles means other principles are functioning. That's the way the argument goes. Anyway, so that's, these are two and a half simple points about the age of the universe and, and evolution, which I hope could neutralize the issues. Again, I'm not trying to prove that the scientific position is wrong. I'm trying to show that there's not reason enough to be convinced that it's right. I'm asking for equal time, equal respect, parity. That's all. Questions? Yeah. Um, there's a point where you, you uh, explained that uh, how did it, how did the octopus be able to be, uh, be able to be comparable to another animal? I didn't understand what you said there. No, no, I didn't. I didn't say. Well, all I said was that the the, the theory of evolution says that life develops. By the way, <laughs> they they say this with some justice, but uh, but you have to take appreciate it. Evolution starts with the first thing that makes copies of itself. If you ask where that came from, which you have a right to ask. After all, they're touting a completely naturalistic picture of the world. So where did that one come from? They say that's not the responsibility of the theory of evolution. The word evolution means developing, changing, growing, progressing. Right? So you've got to have something before it develops and changes and grows. So we're not responsible for that. And the, okay, that's fine. You know, you choose your academic discipline, you draw its lines, and you take up your responsibilities. But eventually, if you want me to believe that it's all natural, you're going to have to explain that also. And origin of life is even worse. Origin of life has nothing to show for it. But okay, leave, leave, that, leave that aside. And you can Google this. OOL, origin of life research. Um, so, you have a, a single cell, which probably is the first self-replicator, or something more basic than a cell, and now you have an octopus. How many changes are there to get from a single cell to an octopus. How many changes in DNA? Six? From a cell to an octopus? Probably not, right? 60, 600, 6,000, 6 million? Okay, and you're telling me that all these changes take place in an undirected, uncontrolled, unmanaged, accidental, random way. Okay, I wanna know, what's the probability of that happening? You tell me something happens by accident I want to know what the probability is. If it's too small, I won't believe you. If it's big enough, I will believe you. And if you can't tell me what it is, then I can't make up my mind whether to believe you or not. And they can't tell you. So since they can't tell you, uh, there's certainly no, no sense to the demand that you have to believe that it's true. Um, I'll mention one more thing, since we, uh, and, and then, I'll, then I'll quit. So, uh, I've heard this also. This is, this is far fewer people say this. Listen, Rabbi. The way life developed is really impossible to get a probability. It's not reasonable to ask people to do some things that are impossible, is it? <laughs> I said, well, you know, um, it's not as if I'm asking you to do it, but I just want to draw the consequences of you not doing it. If it's impossible, then I don't have to wait and hold my breath to see whether you'll do it tomorrow, because you agree that it's impossible. But if it's impossible to get a probability 
that it should happen, then it's impossible to have adequate reason to believe that that's the way it happened. Too bad. That doesn't make it possible because it's unfair to make you do something that's impossible. It just leaves you with the conclusion that it can't be done. So it can't be done. If it can't be done, then I don't have to worry that tomorrow you'll be able to do it because you're not going to do it. Okay. 